All right, so let's pick it up where we left off. Um, we left off basically at the top of that second page here. So we were talking about, um, but what was the overall question? What was the question we were talking about? What was the, what was the general problem? Free will. Okay. Like how can we know that we had it? Yeah, so free will. Or to use a different term, Anselm calls it free choice here. Um, the, reason, the reason for this, the terminological difference is, is subtle, and I'll get into it a little bit. Um, primarily, it's because the term free will doesn't pop up for another couple hundred years. Um, you don't have philosophers really writing about free will and using those terms until the late 13th century. Um, Anselm's writing the 11th. So, um, it, and he means something very slightly different. Um, free will is a narrower, uh, a narrower term than free choice. So he's talking about a, a broader range of things. Um, and then also we're, we're looking at putting free choice up against um, providence, or we can say predestination. That's basically just God to choose his for you. Right, so yeah, so it's this problem of we seem to have causal power and God seems to have causal power over the same things. Uh, so you can't have two causes that are equally fully responsible for something, at least apparently. Um, so how can we be free if God controls everything? That's the fundamental problem that he's out, set out to solve here. So to that end, he needs to talk about what freedom of choice is or what free choice is. And he needs to talk about how God's causal influence works. So we start out looking at, all right, well, what is freedom of choice? So we start off with this ability to sin or not to sin. We knock that out. That doesn't work. So first of all, we also get rid of this little issue of, well, maybe freedom just means different things for God as it does for us. And he wants to say, well, no, it can't be that. It has to mean the same thing even if it applies differently. Right, so it can apply differently to God as it can to us, but it has to fundamentally mean the same thing. All right, so we can pick up from there. And this is why we were talking about the difference between how the term animal applies differently to a cat or to a dog or to a human being. Right. All right, so now we want to look at uh, why it is that the power to sin or the power to do wrong isn't part of free choice. So it's not. According to Anselm, it's not, right? It can't be. Right. Now, we have to be careful. So with that logic, the power to do good is part of free choice? Yep. So the power to do good is part of free choice. Presumably. We have to figure that out still. That's part of freedom. At least not essentially. It's not essential to freedom. Right? The ability to do wrong or the ability to sin isn't essential to freedom. His short version of the argument is because, well, God is free and God can't sin, so it can't be part of freedom. Right? But he also goes into a little more into this. Right? Now, I'm actually going to grab my book so I don't have to keep looking, at, looking up. So... So this is part of his argument here at the end. So here he picks up. Uh, this, is the, this is the top of that second page. Um, well, I mean, technically, I guess we should scroll down just a bit. because It starts down here. So he asks, the teacher asks, which will do you think is freer? One who's willing and whose ability not to sin are such that it cannot be turned away from the rectitude of not sinning, or one that in some way can be turned to sin. So which is freer, the one that's capable of doing the good always, or the one that is capable of being turned away from that? The one that's capable of turning away. Why is that? Because... So, note, that's what the student says. Right? So the student says, I don't see... So we're right here. So the student just answers exactly like you do, right? I don't see why a will isn't freer that's capable of both. That makes sense, right? So yeah. I think it's uh, the fair choice, like the one that you can't sin because like sitting in the 
itself is not free, so like it's kind of like, like once you're sitting, you know. But if you don't okay. have the chance to sit, Sitting in itself is not freedom. So like right. So he's asking here. So he's asking, which is which is more appropriate to freedom, or which is more free, being able to not sin or being able to sin. What's what do we mean by free? Because well, that's what we're trying to figure out. You know what I mean? The way I see so it now uh, let me explain. Do one, not the other. Right, so give me one second here, because, because that's actually a great question. Right, what do we mean by free? Because that's what we're trying to figure out, and he's going about it in a particular way. So he's doing uh, what philosophers will often call an intuition pump, right, to get your intuition started. So to think about, all right, well, we know vaguely what freedom is. We kind of have this vague understanding of what it should mean. So what we do is we've got that framework, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out how to apply it so we can come up with a definition. So what we're saying here is, well, what can freedom mean? It can mean, well, it could mean either one of these things, right? It could mean the ability to sin or not to sin, or it could just mean the ability not to sin, the ability to do good. So intuitively, it seems like, it seems like to your point, we'd be more free if we could choose either way. Right. But then he, bring, then he starts to say, all right, well, well, it's one or the other, so can we rule this out? So which one seems like it's more free? Well, it might be that we can either sin or not sin, right? to go back to the original definition. But then he starts to, to narrow it down and figure out, okay, well, can it actually be that, or does it have to be just this ability to do the good? Does that make sense so far? Okay, yeah. Ability to not be able to sin? Yes. He's not saying it yet, but that is his argument. So say that again, because that was spot on. When you choose to sin, you lose your right to the ability to not be able to sin. So when you choose to sin, what you've done is you've waived your right or you've given up your ability not to sin. Boom. Although, I mean, it's more complicated than that, and he presents yeah, like, like, more of an argument to it. But, yeah. Right. So, and that's, that's part of what we're doing, is we're trying to put this really dense and really complicated philosophy into something like layman's terms that we can work through. Yeah. But what would be the opposite of that? When you choose to not sin, you're just exercising the right to... <coughs> Um, right isn't quite the word I'd use, so like maybe your ability or your power or freedom. Freedom works. I feel like that is making me, it makes me feel like once I sin once, I can never go back to not sinning. You know, I can, maybe that, he can come around <laughs> and strangle me right up front and then go, go to the food bank and, and help out over there. You know, he's choosing to sin at one time. Yeah, but like this option, like he has the setting is no longer an option for him. He's already done it. So that's part of it. Yeah. Then there's also a question of, of changing your inclinations or changing your affections, changing what you want to do by habituation. Right? This kind of goes back to a little bit of what, what Pascal talked about, so being able to habituate yourself into doing something or wanting something. But we'll get there. We can't, we can't jump ahead yet. We've got to figure this out first. So, so the, reason he, the reason really he says that, uh, that we have that being able to not sin is more free is because, um, well, he came, up with, he came up with this on the previous dialogue and on truth, that the, the power of the will, what the will is, is a power for rectitude. It's a power to choose good things. And this is a fairly standard definition, right? Because if you want to choose something, right, if you choose to do something, what are you choosing to do? What are you choosing? What, is, what attracts you to it? Something that might make utility better or give me some sort of value. Yeah, value, benefit, utility, something good in it, right? So you have a choice between chocolate cake and cherry pie. You choose chocolate cake. Why? It's delicious. That's good, right? So your will is inclined towards something good. 
Yeah, but cherry pie isn't bad. Yeah. yeah. Less good. It's less good, at least for you, right? It's, it's, it, it, it aligns less, less correctly with your particular tastes, maybe. Yeah. All right, so um, change the scenario. Chocolate cake or, uh, or horse manure? Huh? Horse manure. Why? To eat. It tastes good. <laughs> to eat? Awesome. Why? Just choosing in general or just... Which one do you choose? Yeah, to eat. Which one? Which one is more appetizing? Which do you choose to eat? Horse manure or a chocolate cake? Okay. Why? If I was fertilizing a lawn, I would choose yeah. manure. That's true. But that's a different good, right? So your will is is either way aligning to some good, right? You're not going to go, hmm. I have a choice uh, for my dessert between chocolate cake and horse manure, and I'm going to choose the one that is purely unpleasant and there is nothing good about it whatsoever. It will provide me no pleasure, no nutrition, and will probably get me grievously ill. Great. <laughs> That's incoherent, right? There's no, there's no way of rationalizing a choice like that. And if someone does make a choice like that, we usually say that they're insane. Right? Because either their will isn't functioning properly, right? so it's something like an addiction, even if it's momentary. Well, maybe crap isn't a good example of this, but but yeah, it's something like an addiction. So they're not capable of choosing otherwise, right? In some really fundamental psychological so way. Being sober, or being you know, or drinking if you're an alcoholic. Yeah, and you know that you know you know the booze is destroying your life, but you keep drinking because you're addicted, right? Or it's or they just don't understand what's going on. They have some kind of mental delusion that that is. That such that they aren't, they think there is some good in the horse manure that's not there, right? If if somebody's on drugs and they mistake it for something so or something like that. In this case, isn't really you know me killing someone or doing something inherently bad. It's just something that might not benefit me. Well, it's just something that's not good in general. So it could be that it doesn't benefit you. So it's imprudent. It's not a good. It's not a a, a practical judgment. Or it could be something that's morally wrong, right? So it doesn't benefit in general. Yeah. So it's any kind of wrongdoing here, any kind of any kind of thing that is not ideal, any kind of action that isn't good, any kind of action that's less than optimal. Let's put it that way. Right. So another example of this that's that's um, I mean it's not it's not Anselm's example, but uh, later philosophers have used this as an illustration of this kind of thing. Who is does anyone speak a language other than English in here? What? Okay. Which language are you more free to speak? Take that however you want. Which language are you more free to speak? Here. In general. Just in general. Great. Um, so that means that you could you could you could tell us what this how to say this right. Easily? Yeah. Okay. Could you do it in French? I can say it destination, just not free. Yeah, so, so kind of. Yeah. How about in Mandarin? No. no, right? So we have a few different languages here, and you're more free to speak one rather than another. Right? I'm perfectly free to say anything in English because I'm capable of doing so. I'm kind of free to say things in Spanish. Because I'm, I'm kind of fluent in Spanish. I can, I can cobble it together. I'm a little bit free to say things in Latin, partially because there's not words for everything I might want to say in Latin. Right? Language is developed. And partially because I'm not fully fluent in it. I'm not free at all to speak Mandarin. Because I just can't do it. Right? I'm, not, I'm not free. I'm not capable. I'm not able to do something. So we have this parallel here that your freedom to do something is also, in a sense, your ability to accomplish it, your ability to do it. So you're not free to do something if you don't have the, cap the capacity for it. Uh -huh. But you have the capability to mm -hmm. earn, and, and you can learn Mandarin. Oh, yeah. Take, it, you can get Rosetta Stone. And you can yeah, it might take me a while. Right? So I'm free in a really remote sense, but not as free as I am to say words in English and sentences in English. As you're taking Rosetta Stone, yeah. Yeah. So just like as I'm, you know, developing my, uh, say, affection for justice, 
I'm becoming more free. My will in general is becoming more free. I'm more capable of doing the good. So you move on a little bit here. So what he says next here seems to straightforwardly contradict what he just said. And that's always the fun part. Um, so beginning chapter two, let's start with this title. He says, uh, nonetheless, angels and human beings sinned through this power and through free choice. Although they were able to be slaves to sin, sin was not able to master them. Now that second clause we'll pick up in a bit. I want to focus on that distinction that he makes here. So he says, through this power, namely free choice, and through free choice, that seems redundant. Why is it, why is it not? What, distinguish, what distinction is he trying to make there? between this power, which is free choice, and through free choice. Kind of. Maybe. Kind of. It's to do with that. It's related to that. This comes back to a distinction we made on Wednesday, if anyone remembers. It goes back here. So what distinction is he making? Why is he why does he talk about the power of free choice and also three and also free choice? Uh, the power of it. He's, he's kind of talking about two different things. Yeah, so what's different? So that's like the mentality, like uh, you know, I have the power to when I was like younger to sneak out at night. Okay. And then I was also that power affected my thinking. Uh-huh. And then uh, the fact of free choice is not really so, we've got the power, or to use his term, we have the instrument. Like if you never learned to sneak out, then you wouldn't have the choice to. Is that yeah, and the kind of the way the power can affect Right. Them. So you have the power of the instrument, then you have what he calls the affection. Available instruments, affection, uh, free choice. Or right, so... Influences your free choice. Right. So whether you have the power to do something is the, fir is the first question. Can you sneak out? Right? You Are you capable of doing so? Your affection is whether you want to, right? whether you have the inclination to do so. And you can't really have the inclination to do so if you can't do it. Right? I mean, maybe you can, maybe you abstractly can, but it's hard to even conceptualize something you're completely incapable of doing. Right? So, well, I could, none of you can. I could think of sneaking out, and mm -hmm. you know, even if my parents you know, locked the doors, have the have bars on the windows, have the alarm, you know. I can still think of, oh, what I would do if I snuck out. Right, but it has to be vague. Yeah, it's not Because if you don't know how to do it, then you can't really conceptualize it in detail. Here's a good example. So um, we can all imagine flying, right? Just unpowered, just take off and fly. None of us can do that. How would you do it? Well, there's an actual plan to do it, I think. Well, how? Like Iron Man. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so maybe we can man. maybe we can construct some technology, but that's really vague too. So if you have like legit Iron Man blueprints, would that be you know? Maybe. So you mean but, like, like some people would fly this way, some people would fly this way, like some people would spread their arms, some people wouldn't. Like, and some people would do the Superman thing. Right, yeah, there'd be different ways of doing it. But then even further still, what's the mechanics of it? How do you do it? What happens? What causes this to occur? We all have to answer with a shrug. Right, Because we don't know how to do it. If we knew how to, we could. We would have the power. We'd have the instrument of flight. Or if we knew how to sneak out, we'd have the power to. We'd have that instrument. Yeah. Right? And so if we have the affection, we kind of have to have this. Or this is just going to be vague and we're not really going to, there's not going to be any content behind it. And then certainly, we're not going to be able to do the next part, which is the exercise of the will which is actually choosing to do it. Now, worth noting, I can choose to fly right now. No, 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 I can choose to just like take off and fly around the room right now. Yeah, I can't do it, but I can choose to. Right? So I can, ha I can have the exercise of a power that I don't have, strictly speaking. 
And I can choose to fly, but nothing will happen. Right? So these are distinct ideas. And these are distinct things that can exist independently to some degree, but only to a relatively minor degree. They can't exist separately and effectively. Right. They can't exist effectively. Yeah, you can't actually exercise a power you don't have. Now, you can exercise the choice. You can choose to do so. And that tells us something. That tells us that we do have the instrument of free choice. Even though we don't have the power to do particular things, we can still choose them. And we still always have that this basic power to choose. That's why he's making this distinction between this power, in other words, the power of free choice, and choosing. Choosing might be a better way of saying it. Right? He's distinguishing between this and this, between the power or the instrument and the exercise. Affection comes in later. We need to make this distinction because, well, both of them are relevant, right? both of them are related, and it's still through the exercise of some power that you know human beings, and in this case he talks about angels as well, that they sinned, but it's not as simple and straightforward as just one thing happening. Right? There's multiple factors to consider. Okay, so he goes on. How is it that it was still through free choice that we chose to do evil, or that we choose even in the present to do evil, if that isn't essential to free choice, if that isn't essential to freedom? Any ideas, thoughts? How is it that we choose to do wrong if choosing to do wrong isn't part of freedom? Yeah, okay. So, so maybe there's still some good there that the will is aiming at. So there's an element of that. Because choosing, and then we have the ability to choose in and of itself. Yeah, so we have the ability to choose. So that can be applied in different ways, yeah. It's like, uh, we have the ability to choose free choice. Mm -hmm. Like, is that doing bad is not essential to free choice? We still have free choice, then we can just the other free choice and we just choose not to actually utilize. So choosing not to utilize free choice, maybe something like that. Something to add? Um, simply saying is that like, choose not to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. When you choose not to do the right thing, essentially you do the wrong thing. Yeah, so we're on the, we're on the right track. Um, so one, one terminological thing that might help us out, uh, where he says, um, where, where somebody chooses to sin, you know, sin out of, uh, out of free choice or out of necessity. Right? He makes this distinction here, and this is in the middle of the middle paragraph. Oops. They sin either spontaneously or out of necessity. These are a couple of those opposites that are on the quiz. What does that mean? What is to sin spontaneously or to act spontaneously? What do you mean? About it, maybe? Like, One would think. That's usually how we use the term today, but that's not how Anselm is using it here. This is a, this is a really precise technical term um, of the, the translation of the Latin sponte, if that matters to anyone. It's in the glossary. That's why I ask. Um, all right, so this is a really precise technical term. Right? So to act uh, without any kind of reason or to act uh, without preconsideration right? um, or impulsively, right, we might say. That's not what he's talking about. Uh, so to quote, in this technical sense, an act is spontaneous or an, act, or an agent acts spontaneously when the act can be fully explained only by reference to something that originates within the agent. So it can only be explained with reference to something originating within the agent. In other words, it isn't caused by something outside the person causing it. What? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it has to have no 
outside. No? Is that good or? So like a reactionary throwing my hands up and slapping someone behind me back, that's not spontaneous by the definition, but me right, so around and punching someone behind me just, you know, like that for no reason would be because I just thought of it in my head. Even if you have a reason for it. And here's why. So you can do something spontaneously and have a reason for doing it. But, but it has to be out of your capacity for choice. And it can't be simply by nature. What I mean by that is, so I have a marker in my hand, right? This has the nature of a material body. And this is a material thing. So if I open my hand and drop this, it'll fall to the ground naturally. That was not a spontaneous action. However, if I were to fall to the ground, if I were to just like knock my legs out from under me and fall to the ground, that would be spontaneous. Because you let you an out external force of the marker let go of it that caused it to drop down, but right. you slapping your own foot is internal. I'm acting, right? I'm doing something. There's nothing about my nature, my inherent nature, and nothing about outside causal forces that determine that I will fall to the ground, right? I can do one way or the other. Yeah. So you you drop the marker, it's Necessary. Mm -hmm. If you throw the marker, it would be spontaneous. Well, if I drop the marker, it's still spontaneous in that I dropped it, but it falling or it flying across the room, its action is natural. Now, my actions can be natural as well. If I do something that isn't, like my heart beating right now, that's natural. Right. Um, even if I do something accidentally, if I don't intend, if I don't intend something, that could be either spontaneous or natural, depends on how it works, right? So if, if, so if I do something by reflex, then that would be natural, right? Like if I have de developed a reflex to like block something, if someone throws something at me, that can be a, a natural response in that I didn't choose to do it, I didn't consider it. it the, cause, the cause of me throwing up my hands to block something about to hit my face is the thing about to hit my face. That's what caused it, right? I had no input on that. By contrast, if, if I haven't developed that reflex, say, okay, so if I grew up never having anything thrown at me, and I see something throwing at me, and I think, oh, I better remove that. Right? I think about it, and I act on it, I do it, that's spontaneous. It's a matter of me choosing to do it. It's a matter of the origin of the causal series being exclusively in me and it not being caused fully by things outside of me. So just the, the, the idea of it. So the idea of, the idea of blocking something from hitting, hitting your face is completely foreign to you, and you block something before it hit your face, that would be spontaneous. Well, no, I can have, I can have the thought, right? I can know what I'm doing. Right? So I can spontaneously take a drink of coffee. I know what coffee is. I know how the cup works. I know how to tip it towards my face, right? So if someone's throwing a football at your face, you catch it on purpose, mm -hmm. it's spontaneous, but if yeah. you don't, you know, you just react because it's going to hit you. Yeah, or if it hits me and I flinch, right? It's, it's, it's spontaneous either from my nervous system or just from it, you know, impacting me and I'm knocked back or, right? So one way of looking at this, so spontaneous actions. Begin new causal series. Right? A spontaneous action has no antecedent cause. It doesn't have causes before it that determine what's going to happen. Right? So there's nothing, there's nothing that causes me to be in a certain way such that I will make a certain choice. Otherwise, my actions aren't spontaneous. They're just natural. Which is why we say that animal actions are natural. They don't have this faculty or instrument of will that humans do in the same way. So another example, we can go back to the addiction example. Someone may not spontaneously choose to shoot heroin. That may be something that is, uh, that is imposed on them by, by some outside factor, that they don't have a choice in the matter. Now, starting to take heroin, right, choosing to try it, right, that would be a spontaneous choice. 
So there's nothing imposing on them from the outside. There's nothing forcing that decision. Now, if someone gets addicted to heroin by someone like forcibly injecting them, or better example, real world example, someone gets addicted to morphine because they were in the hospital for a long time and get a constant morphine drip. This happens all the time. Yeah, yeah. So, so if someone has a heroin addiction because they were addicted to morphine in the hospital, right, and that wasn't something that they chose to do, then there you go. None of that was spontaneous. So this is a, this is a fairly important distinction because we're looking at the origin of causal series, where the causing starts. So for a spontaneous action, there's one cause at least in one respect. We'll look at what we might mean by that. But there's one primary cause, and that's the agent acting. Now that there are other factors that, that contribute to it, that need to happen, but we'll come back to that. So on this note, we can continue. Having this distinction in mind. So it brings up this example of talking about being a slave to sin, or sin having the power to enslave the will. And what he wants to say is, the will can be enslaved to sin, but sin does not have the power to enslave the will. How does that work? Any thoughts, any ideas? Your will can be enslaved to sin, but sin cannot enslave the will? Right. That. The will can be enslaved to sin. But, this, but sin cannot enslave the will. So you can choose to sin, mm -hmm. but your life, you can't constantly sin every second of every day? It's more like... Not exactly, you can be, yeah. You, you can be, be quote-unquote addicted to going to Bucks games, but the Bucks can't force you to go to every game. Something like that. Yeah, that's, that's a good example. Right, so you can, you can be addicted to something, but the thing doesn't have the power to addict you. Yeah. But if it's addictive, right. like with heroin, it is addictive. Uh -huh. It isn't physically saying, hey, you have to shoot me up, but it's got the properties that... So here you go. Here's a, here's a question to clarify the example. We'll use you as an example, because you keep talking about heroin. <laughs> Are you addicted to heroin? Uh, no. Good. Um, could you be? I, if I had some, maybe. Okay, what would you have to do to get addicted to heroin? You'd, you'd have to take it. Yes. If you don't take heroin, and it's sitting over there, can it addict you? No. 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 That's what he's talking about. That makes more, that's, that makes sense. Right? that's a great example. I mean, he uses a different example here, which I do want to still mention, because it's pretty good. But that's fantastic, right? So heroin's addictive, right? But it can't addict you. You have to enslave your will to the thing that's going to enslave you. So another, uh, so the analogy he presents is, is a rich man and a poor man. So the poor man can't make the rich man his debtor or put the rich man in his debt or make the rich man his slave. He's not capable of doing that. Right? He doesn't have any power over what the rich man does with his money. But the rich man can choose to put himself in the poor man's debt. And then he will be. Then he'll, he'll owe the poor man something. So, you know, if I um, suppose, unrealistically, I have a lot of money. Um, so you're not a professor? <laughs> or I have that uh, Tenured professors make good money. Uh, I'll get there eventually, maybe. Um, uh, maybe. In any case, um, so supposing I have a lot of money and supposing I have a checkbook, Right. And I write a check to one of you guys. Right. What I've done is I've put myself in your debt in some respect. Right. You can cash that. And that, what that means is you have a demand on my money that, that I have promised to pay. What I've done is I've put myself in your debt. You can't say, right, you can't just go to the bank and say, I'd like to withdraw some money from Vincent McCoy's account. Right. It's not going to work. But you can if you have you know, something from me saying that you can do that. I, it's at home, but... Yeah, but nobody cares about their checkbook. Yeah. I thought you just like... Careful now. I live up in the country, and 
I've been behind people at Winn-Dixie who do definitely carry a checkbook. <laughs> and sometimes it's wet, which is just the worst thing ever. Oh, yeah, no, it's bad. Anyway, um, <laughs> side topic. Point being, right, that the, the will is like the rich man right, in this scenario, or like you with respect to heroin. The will can, can enslave itself, but it can't be enslaved by something without its consent, at least initially. And that's why we can say that the choice to sin was a genuine free choice. It was part of at least something of this process. But, it, so sin doesn't have the power to enslave the will, but the will can choose to sin. Now the question still arises, how does that work if sinning isn't part of freedom? All right. So let's move on a little bit to three. So chapter three talks about what is free choice such that it can do all of these seemingly contradictory things. It can either, it, it doesn't include the power to sin, but it can give rise to sinning. It can, it can, well, it can choose to be enslaved to sin. And it can do wrong things, even though that's not part of its characteristic power. It's real what it's for. So, something to note here. We already asked, what is, now we're, we're around this area. I'm jumping ahead a little bit. We're around this area. So what is the will for? What does the will do? The ability to do good. Right, it's the ability, well, in particular, it's the ability to choose good. Because you can, you can have the ability to choose something without having the ability to do something, right? the flying example. Right? So it's the ability to choose the good. Right? Or in order to attain rectitude, right, where the mouse is. Right. And now you say will, but you mean will. Yeah. So, he, again, synonymously. So the will is, the will is any of these things, right? And it's always free unless it enslaves itself, or unless it allows itself to be enslaved. Right. So... If what the will is, is the ability to choose the good, then how is it that it can choose bad? Maybe, right? So it chooses, it chooses bad as a way of attaining good. Or maybe it chooses a lesser good, right? choosing cherry pie instead of chocolate cake, to, at least for you. Right? Yeah, it's, it's through a kind of inaction. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, where does he talk about this? So, this is where we get into this. This is where this distinction becomes really important. Because what he's going to wind up saying is we always have this, the instrument. We always have the instrument for willing. Because the instrument for willing is always going to be directed towards the good in some capacity. But what we can do is through choosing not to do the good, what we've done is we've exercised the will not fully. We haven't fully exercised it. And we've inclined the will not fully away from the good by choosing to exercise it, not fully. And I say this in a weird kind of way, just because it's the only way in English to convey the, the Latin terms. Um, the, the negation in Latin can attach to particular words in much, more, much more carefully than it can to English. We attach the negative to clauses. So we would say that it doesn't fully attain the good. Um, Latin would say it it attains the good not fully. But English, that's weird. So that's why I'm talking funny. But the point here is that we still have this power. Right? So we still have free will. But free will is incapable of, do, of choosing the good fully. 
because we've abandoned the affection for the good, or at least to its utmost. Right. Moving on here, right? So, using an example here. He analogizes this to seeing and to sight. So this is an example I, used, I mentioned Wednesday as well. So I can see. We can mean that in a couple of ways. We can say by that, I can see you, meaning I, my eyes are open. I am visually taking in the information of you, right? I'm perceiving you. What do I need to do that? OK, yeah, so I need the faculty of vision which includes you know, eyeballs, um, a functioning optic nerve, a brain, et cetera. Right? The stuff that allows me to have the capacity for vision. Right? I have the power of vision. All right, what else do I need to be able to see you? Okay. So there are parts of this. And they're the same parts as that. What do you mean? Hmm. Yeah, so I also, in addition to the power, I need the affection, I need the exercise. Right. So that's these same parts. That's true, right? So if I, you know, if something just passes through my field of vision, I'll see it, even if I'm not looking at it. And th this, is a, this is a linguistic distinction as well as an important one, but... It's not exactly what he's talking about here. But so we have the capacity to see something, whether we're directing our eyes to it or not. So what else do I need in order to see you? Light. Light. What's that doing? Reflecting off us. Yeah. Yeah, so we need light, which is what allows me to see. Right, it, it assists. All right, what else? What else do we need? What else do I need to see you? Us. Yeah. Something visible. Uh, and some uses a mountain. This is an example. Right? Someone who can see a mountain. What else do I need? I need one more thing. That's true. But that's all kind of included in the visible thing. No obstruction. Uh, I need no blindfold, for example, or eyelids. So I need to be able to see. I need something to see. I need something to see it with, and I need nothing stopping me. I need all of these things in order to see something. All of these are equally and critically important for the exercise of any power. Any power or any faculty or any instrument in order for it to be exercised. So any, to, again, looking to the footnote, any action or task or operation or something I'm doing, right? Anything like that is going to require all of these things. Going to, it's going to need the power to do it. It's going to need something that permits it to happen, something that allows it to happen. It's going to need the thing that's being acted upon. And, or, so we would say an object. And we would need nothing to stop it. All right, so quoting. So you see the power of seeing some body. So again, what is a body here? What is he talking about? Some body, two words. What does he mean? Right, so keep in mind when he says a body, he's talking about a material being. So rocks and chairs and tables and humans. So the power to see one body is one power in the one who sees, another power in the object to be seen. Right? So this has the power of being visible to some extent, to, in some way. Right? We can say that and mean something by it. Another in the medium, right? so the light that allows it to be seen. And in the medium, there is one power in something that gives aid and another that does not impede. 
right? So the medium of seeing, so the light that allows it to be seen and the lack of a hand in front of your face that allows it to be seen. So you need the vision, you need something that allows it to be seen, and you need something to be visible. Now he says, these are then four powers. If any, of, if any one of them is lacking, the other three cannot accomplish anything, either individually or altogether. So, if you're asleep, you don't have the faculty of vision, or you don't have the, effect, the, you don't have the affection for it, at least. Right? So you're not, you're not capable of exercising your, your faculty of vision if you're asleep. Even supposing there are no obstructions, so you sleep with your eyes open, say, there is light in the room and there are things to see, you're still not seeing them. So without vision, you're not going to see anything. If all the lights are off, if we're not actually, if all of the lights are off and, here, let's do it. Um, no. Can you still read that? Barely. Barely. You've, yeah, that's pretty bright, so. Here, let's be mean. And, uh, now can you read it? No. I didn't think so. No, let's not do that anymore. All right. I really hope this actually works. There we go. So without light, even though there's nothing obstructing your vision, your vision is still working fine, and the text is still there to be read, you can't see it. Now, if you close your eyes... Your eyelids are now obstructing. Right? So if this isn't working, then the thing isn't there. Further still, if I erase this part, you can no longer see it. There's nothing there being visible. So all of these are necessary in order for the power to be, actual, to be exercised. However, oh, dang it, I meant to keep that erased. If I do erase this and there's nothing visible, your vision is still working. There's still light in the room and there's still nothing obstructing you. So this is where he says, he continues, and yet when the other three are missing, we, can't, we do not deny that a person who has vision has vision or the instrument or power for seeing or that the visible thing can be seen or that light can aid vision. In other words, even if we don't have a thing to be seen. Right? In other words, if we can't see something, we can still see. Even if there's no light, we can still see. The thing might still be there. Right? So just because a power can't be exercised due to something doesn't mean we don't have the power. Right? So. So then he continues, and this is where we're going to conclude for today. We're kind of out of time, but I'm going to wrap up here. Chapter 4, first of all, he notes that this isn't, properly speaking, a power. right? Because all it requires, this, this fourth one, the not being obstructed, that just requires something to not act. So that's not, strictly speaking, a power. So moving on from that, um, it might be important, but it's not as important as the others. We can still, it's important to note here that you can have the power of something without it being exercised and even without it being able to be exercised because of some impediment or because of a lack of some object. In other words, applying this to the will, we can still have the instrument even if we don't have the affection to use it properly nor if we do not exercise it properly. So in other words, you can have a free will even if it isn't free. Free being <laughs> the other things available in order to exercise it? Yeah, so it's free in itself, but it's not exercised freely. All right. All right, so that'll have to wrap it up, uh, and we can pick this up at Chapter 5 when we come back.